All right. I'm Ruth Gombrook Munoz here with Dr. Lacey Abrego to talk about her book, Sacrificing Families. Thank you so much for having this conversation with me. I really appreciate it. Thanks. Thanks for inviting me and for using the book in your class. Oh, I'm delighted. It's one of my favorites. Um, so I was wondering if, if maybe we could just start out by you talking to us about the book. Just tell us a little bit about it uh, and, you know, what made you write it? So it's kind of a, a long meandering process. Um, I came into grad school to study Salvadoran migration and found very early on that my professors didn't think that was interesting enough or important enough. So um, I wasn't able to develop that as a master's paper and in the process of doing the master's paper, when I worked with undocumented youth from, from different countries, I learned that family separation through migration was actually kind of common for people from different countries. And I reconnected with so many of the things that I had grown up hearing about because my own family had gone through that. And I had assumed that that was a my family issue or if anything, maybe it was the Salvadoran issue because I had heard of so many people who didn't have their kids here with them. And being able to hear from undocumented youth who I wasn't asking about their family separation experiences, but when I talk about their childhood or migration more broadly, it kept coming up. It kept coming up for them, even if they were apart for only a few months it really marked their lives in very powerful ways and they wanted to talk about that. So it alerted me to the fact that this is an important story and I had to push through the idea that maybe nobody would care about this and, and develop this project as a dissertation. So it was my dissertation project. I went into it wanting to think about gender and migration and in the process learned that legal status matters tremendously for, for migration, for family separation, for the experience of it on both ends. And, and so I, I ended up turning the dissertation into what is now my first book. I, I love this book. I know I've told you like a thousand times. I'm, as a parent, one of the things that's most meaningful to me is your discussion of how uh, gender shapes how parents think about parenting as labor migrants who are oftentimes not able to be present with their children. And so I was just wondering, you know, this book came out in 2014 in the middle of the Obama administration, which of course oversaw more deportations and family separations, right, than any other administration. And we're currently living through this political moment with the Trump administration in which, you know, everything that you write about just feels so intensified. And so I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about how your book can help us understand what's going on in this sort of, you know, social context of, mass detention and separation and deportation? Yeah, my, my sense is that different people take different things from the book, right? In writing it, one of my key hopes was that people would recognize that what happens here in the U.S. has consequences far beyond U.S. borders, that the policies, the practices that we hear about here have really meaningful and, and, you know, often devastating consequences in people's lives beyond here. And, and so I think as we have this moment of reckoning with police and with the structures in place in this country that have been reproducing racial injustice for as long as it has existed as a nation state, um, that we think about what happens beyond US borders as well, because there will be consequences, whatever happens here, given the way that the United States has intervened and exploited and you know, 
taken advantage of resources and people in places throughout the world, anything that happens here will have consequences beyond the borders. And that's such a critical case in El Salvador, right? I mean, you can't understand Salvadoran migration without understanding U.S. involvement in Central America. Not at all. I do this thing in my class where I show the graph of, of Central American migration, right? Salvadoran, Guatemalan, Honduran, Nicaraguan. Um, and I, I show that migration rates were pretty flat. I mean, there were, you know, a few thousand people in the late 70s from those countries in the U.S. And it's not that there wasn't poverty already. It's not that there weren't, you know, there wasn't political persecution. You know, all of that was going on, but it was really U.S. investment in destabilization in that region that forced so many to have to leave. They couldn't survive there. It was physically impossible to, to do so. So it meant that having connections with the U.S. through the economy and through the military, um, particularly military and, and you know, diplomatic presence in Central America that people started to come here. There's no, like you said, there's no way to understand that migration without understanding the U.S. role in creating it. Yeah, that's such an important point. And so I wanted to know how you, since Sacrificing Families has come out, how you've been building on that work um, in your current and, and future projects. I wish I could say that, you know, I, I think this out and I have a plan and, and I follow that plan. And really, I kind of go wherever life and conversations take me. And so um, a lot of the research happened for that book before my kids were born. And so for a good several years, I didn't travel to El Salvador. So I didn't continue that kind of transnational approach for a while. Um, as they got older and I felt that it was okay to bring them there again, we've been together a few times. And so then I've, you know, been able to engage again with what's happening there. Um, there's some things that I've worked on that are about that. Since 2014, um, when we started to see the detention of especially mothers and children, but also what, what were being called unaccompanied minors. Um, and we saw that just that expansion of that kind of detention. My heart's really been in, in that, all of what's happening first along the border. And then we saw it happen as people were moved to different parts of the country. And it's not the kind of project where I feel comfortable yet going and sitting down with someone and asking them to do an interview because it feels like so, so heavy. And I have very little to offer them in return, right? So I haven't felt comfortable doing that work. And because my work typically involves interviews, I had to find other ways to write about what was happening. And I've been looking into archives or um, just different resources that I can find online that I can read about and make connections across different moments in Salvadoran migration history. Um, so I've been trying to write around all of that that's been happening instead of kind of going in the way that most of my work does with, with people because I think learning from people is such a powerful way of, of getting information. Um, I also, I have other projects that have continued my, like I mentioned, my master's was based on just hanging out at a community based organization and meeting young people who then happened to start organizing around, um, the fact that they were undocumented and couldn't access college at the time. Right. So, uh, the, those are relationships that I built and that I continue to, to be a part of 
in terms of the, the social movement for migrant rights. And, and so I still write about those things. I have a book coming out that I co-edited with Genevieve Negron Gonzalez that is titled We Are Not Dreamers. And it is 10 chapters of undocumented scholars, either currently or formerly undocumented. Um, and so it's, it's a continuation of that kind of thread of my work as well. So there, there's various things on the table right now. That's great. I'm going to have to have you back via Zoom to talk about We Are Not Dreamers. That sounds like such an exciting project. And I know, I'm really proud of it. Yeah, thank you. I bet. No, and, and I know that you, that a lot of your work has been focused um, on, you know, working with mixed status and undocumented college students. And I know that part of your work recently has also been uh, pushing UCLA to establish a Chicano and Chicano studies program. And I want to congratulate you because that campaign was successful and you are the first, you're the inaugural chair of the department. Is that right? Well, it's a little um, more complicated than that. In this, So there was a department, Chicano and Chicano studies, um, has been around at UCLA for a long time, and the department was established after a hunger strike in the 1990s. Um, and what has changed recently is that we expanded the name. So the name now officially is, it's a long name, it's the Cesar E. Chavez Department of Chicana, Chicano, and Central American Studies. And so that's the part that's new. That's the part that recognizes the work that some of us are doing in the department that we were hired to do. And it's very exciting. Undergrad students and now increasingly graduate students have been calling for such uh, an emphasis in our work, such a recognition of the work that we're doing. And hopefully an expansion of, of that work within the department. So it is, it's an exciting time. And yes, I am now the chair of the department. That's really exciting. Congratulations. And thank, thank you, you so much for taking the time to talk with me about your lovely book. I, I really appreciate it. Thank you. I'm also a big fan of your work and I'm excited to know that you're going to have these discussions in your classroom. Thank you.